Ellis, you're wondering if this is my real accent. Um, yes. Yes, this is the way I speak. I am known to put on one or two from time to time, but this one that you're currently hearing is the general way of, uh, of speaking. I, I'm glad it doesn't offend you too much. Um, why does it surprise you? Do I sound very different? On we go. Sometimes I do put on a little one like this when I am trying to uh, make uh, something out of a sighting that isn't really much of a sighting, but that is my real one. Okay, so I thought you'd appreciate today. I would talk like I was... Well, like what we call a boot, a boot from Joburg, and that's a kind of oak, is kind of a guy that is, uh, he's a man's man, likes to be with the boys, have a drink now and then, go to the gym, get big and strong, you know, he's got all the kit, spends a lot of money on his appearance, he looks good, he's from Joburg, he's one of the guys, you know, what, what we call one of the mana here, here by South Africa, anyway. That's how I'm going to talk for the pre-show because, I, I don't know, it's quite nice to talk like this sometimes. Sometimes it's nice not to speak in a refined way. Yeah, yeah, I was playing rugby this weekend and oh, this guy came out and I tackled him to the ground, flattened him like that and he, he didn't get up again. Yeah, well, I was also, but I was outside, uh, I was outside trying to catch a taxi and this guy came past and he said he took my taxi and I decked him one and he fell over. Yeah, yeah, me too. I also did the same thing. Because if you are talking about communism and the allegories to communism, perhaps you need to use Russian accent because of course they were the inventors of communism. Now, this is the best Russian accent I can do. We do have a Russian in the camp, but he is virtually silent. He almost says nothing at all. So we have to talk to him like this in order to make him talk back to us. And that is Alex. Yeah, Alex was no CCC, but he's getting up I think that is his name. But no one knows what his name because he didn't tell us. Then we have a man from Delhi in India. And he has got a beautiful accent. It is very nice to talk to him. I find it very soothing. I find it very calming to talk to Anwar. Anwar is also on the tech team. So <laughs> Anwar says he's not from Delhi, he's from Calcutta. Of course. I'm sorry, Anwar. Anwar and I do driving lessons once a day and while he is driving I am learning his accent or trying to. Thank you Anwar. And then of course he has the Germans. Ein, zwei, drei. I don't speak any German at all but I can say words like Brandenburg Gate und Berlin und Hamburg und kannst dich bitte eine Flasche Wasser haben? May I have a glass of water, please? That is my German. I like to talk in the German accent, especially when I am angry or trying to get my point across. I find that this is a very effective way to make people listen. If you say to them, listen to me, I'm talking to you now, they will listen if you say it in this accent. Of course, if you are actually a German and listening to me, you're probably thinking, what a total idiot, which is fair enough. Hello, Ruby, all the way in Berlin. Please excuse my terrible German accent. Um, <laughs> I can't help myself. <laughs> One must talk with a gentle uh, French accent because it is the accent of love. One can imagine uh, giving one's uh, bow uh, a bouquet of flowers and expecting a little kissy in return. That would be nice. And then if you are getting really into it, you can just drop the, ears, the odd and what you are saying. So, uh, bonjour, my love. How are you? It is nice to see you, that sort of thing. And it just gives it a bit more oomph. You know what I mean? That is the French. Of course, also, there is the Irish. And I'm 
I managed a Southern Irish accent, all right. Of course, it's a mix because if you're from Ireland, it sounds different depending on which part of Ireland you're from. So this is kind of just a generic Irish one. And I quite like it because you can do the pikey. You know what the pikey is? The pikey is a lo- lo- like a gypsy. You know, talk very fast, talk like this, and talk about dags, and talk about things that Ronan want to go do. We're going to go find a leopard, turn it towards the water, see what we can find there. And, or you can do a little bit more slowly. But what I have yet to master is the is the Northern Irish that uh, Liam Neeson's got, and that's really nice as well. Liam Neeson's got a beautiful accent, but I've, I've yet to manage it properly. God, that's the Irish. Oh, Anna, you're in Ireland and you're thinking to yourself, you know, there's so many cows here in Ireland. Uh, what are cows in Africa? You probably don't speak like that at all. It's just every possible excuse I get to attempt to speak in an Irish accent, I do so. One is the gentle Edinburgh Burrell, which is very attractive to listen to, and the other is the glass waiting, like Billy Connolly, who says, Get out of here! Billy Connolly also says naughty words. We're going to see you later. We're going back to Jimmy, who's got some proper animals. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr Impala, but Lewis, age six in Scotland, would like to know if you're able to do a handstand, even though you've got skinny arms. What are you two up to over here, eh? One of you behind the other, hmm? What's going on here? What have I catch the two of you in the middle of? Yes, I know. I suspect Hanky Panky going on here. They was busted. The male behind the female. She's looking a bit shy. He's looking quite pleased with himself. It was previously thought that the colour of a male giraffe's spots were, was related to their age, but Castles said some males never darkened and others even lost pigmentation. We know that rather than simply indicating age, colour may display male's physical condition and be used in other ways to signal competitive ability to others, she said. Speaking about her paper in the journal Animal Behaviour, which is based on 66 Itosha males, she said. Male male giraffe colours may function in a similar way to a lion's mane, as lions with dark manes are usually dominant and preferred by females. We think that darker, more dominant male giraffes use an often successful but risky mating tactic, roaming between groups of giraffes looking for sexually receptive females. In contrast, the lighter, less dominant males may be making the best of a bad situation, so to speak, by remaining with the females in the hope of getting lucky when the dominant male is not around. Jed and Zach in New Zealand are wondering about... What are they wondering again? Oh, yes. Jed and Zach are wondering how long a giraffe's tongue is. Jed and Zach, this is my New Zealand accent. I know it's very bad, but I'm going to go with it anyway. A giraffe's tongue is about 10 inches long, which is about a foot. So it'll stick out of its mouth about that far. It's quite far, don't you think? And it's a delightful black colour. And it's a black colour, they think, because it stops it getting sunburned. I just don't believe that, though. Thank you, Tony Tutos. You see, enjoy the meandering conversations on these quiet drives where we just talk gently about stuff and shoot the breeze and consider different things about life out here in the wilderness. I hope life for you, Tony, is uh, okay, that your enormous criminal enterprises have not taken too much of a hit as a result of 18. Maybe you're going to get into uh, contraband again, or maybe uh, prohibition will kick off again and you'll be able to make some time out of that. Certainly in South Africa, I imagine you'd find a ready market because our liquor outlets are closed. You're not allowed to get a drink out here. And so very soon people are gonna start distilling their own. 
And then we're going to need distribution, Tony, and that's probably where you come in. <laughs> Tony's just replied to say he can still send the boys out two at a time. Yeah, Tony, I knew you'd make a plan. That's good. Two at a time out there go. You're keeping your authority going, yeah. Because, you know, you take a break for two seconds and someone else will jump in the gap you made. Good for you, Tony. This bird is so dangerous that I don't think anybody can believe how dangerous it is. Look at it. Look how spiky its beak is. It's so dangerous. And if you happen to be a guinea fowl, or a Franklin, or any other kind of a bird, this is the most dangerous bird in the whole world. It's more dangerous than a chicken hawk, even. It is an African hawk eagle. And if you are another bird, it will eat you. It and its partner will fly around and it will eat you. So it's not a good thing to be around this dangerous bird. I have no idea why I'm talking like this and I will stop immediately. Okay, hog fishing says he's got a southern accent, so he sounds a bit different. So what he said was, that's got to be one of the most crazy looking pieces of megafauna in all the world, especially the bit where the neck meets the shoulders. Hog fishing. You got a southern accent. Let me try again. I'm gonna try once more. That's gotta be one of the most crazy looking pieces of megafauna in the world. Especially the bit where the neck meets the shoulder. My southern accent is not very good. Now it's getting a bit better as I practice speaking with it. Mm mm mm. Can you believe it? Look at the way he turns his head up towards the top of the tree. That's because his axis atlas joint is able to bend, bend at 180 degrees, whereas ours can only bend at around 90 degrees. I do like to say the word bend with a southern accent. Bend. Good morning and welcome to this Halloween sunrise safari. I don't know what mask I'm wearing or why I should talk like this, but it is a terrifying day here, and we are very scared to see what is going to be out here. My name is Count Dracula, and I am wearing the mask from a friend of mine from uh, Friday the 13th, which it is not today. <laughs> On camera today is Lucifer himself. No, it's not. It's Sebastian. Ugh. And one night we were driving home trying to find something to look at and we saw a chameleon. And many of you would have seen a chameleon with us. And Johnson, who was the tracker, he was fantastic. He shone the light on the chameleon and he said in his extremely deep voice, he said, a million. So I said, look everybody, there's a chameleon. Mrs. Smith said, why you're stopping? I said, well, because there's a chameleon over there. She said, oh my God, is it poisonous? So I said, uh, no, no, uh, Judy, it's, it's not poisonous at all. It's a chameleon. It uh, changes color. It's a really interesting thing. And before I could get any further into my explanation of the astonishing biology of the flat-necked chameleon, Judy said the following. Oh, my God! There's a snake! There's a snake! Drive! Drive! It's coming this way! I said, Judy, hold on. And uh, Johnson says to me, it's a brunch. She says, it's not a branch, it's a snake, it's coming this way, drive! And she became utterly hysterical. So I did this. We were looking at the chameleon over there. There was the chameleon, and I went like this, because I was now in a... I was, well, slightly irritated. I started the engine, I went like this. At which point, the tracker 
basically fell out of the car because he was laughing so much. And <laughs> as I slowed down, she says, Why are you slowing down? They're coming, they're coming. So I eventually stopped, I don't know, some distance down the road. There's some uh, zebras in front of us. I'm going, they're going to be very frightened by the next bit of the story. So I stopped the car, calmed them down. I said, now look, I promise you there was no stake. And the son said, I also saw the snake, Mom. I saw it. And so I said, really? He said, the snake I saw was green. And she said, oh, my God. There were two of them. The snake I saw was gold with black stripes on it. So instead of thinking the obvious, which was, oh, then there wasn't a snake, Mom goes, Oh my God, there were two snakes chasing us down the road. Drive! Drive! Get us home! And that's my story of the guests.